Um, yeah, so last week in Berlin, we had the immutable, um, sorry, the image-based Linux summit and immutable systems, a large part of that. And um, Leonard and um, Luca ran the show and did actually a great job in doing so. We were just Thank amazed you. as a one part of a much greater community. We had folks from Ubuntu, uh, SUSE, Fedora CoreOS, um, Arch Linux, and I probably forgot half of us. We're working out. We're working out a minutes, so there's like a detailed thing later on. But um, enough from me. Just give the word uh, to the folks who ran the show, Luca. Thank you. Yeah, I can get started and have a couple of minutes to have a quick introduction, and then maybe we can look at a couple of topics in more details. So, uh, Leonard, myself, and Christian Browner, who is the other organizer, but he's not here because he's on holiday, the Skyver, imagine that. Um, but in the past few years, we've been working on the generic topic of image-based Linux uh, with a heightened interest on security. Um, both because of the internal projects at Microsoft, uh, but also from external inputs and requests. So we spent a lot of time, you know, thinking, tinkering, pondering. And then at some point we realized that a lot of vendors and distributions are pretty much working in the same or similar areas, doing similar enough things, but more or less each in, uh, everyone in their own way, in their own corner. So. We, at some point we thought, can we do better? Can we establish some collaboration patterns and at the very least have a shared understanding of the space and the terminology, the concepts, maybe specifications, if not implementations. Um, so from this, then we quickly come to the idea of organizing a summit. Um, the idea was to have a very a small meeting, so 30 people or so, uh, from a representative section of the industry, uh, at least from those vendors and groups and organizations that have shown to be working in this area and these topics, and invite them, get all together in a room and just talk about stuff. Um, and so it was. Uh, last week, as Theo said, we met in the Microsoft office in Berlin on the 5th and 6th of October. We had 30 participants. Uh, this was, again, intentionally invitation only. There was It was not open to the public. It was not recorded. We will not publish videos or anything. We publish a summary and, and minutes and so on. Uh, but we intentionally wanted to have a free flow of discussion and, and topics. It was pretty much a birds of a feather style session. Um, so as Sigo said, we had uh, many participants. We had uh, Microsoft, Red Hat, uh, Ubuntu, Debian, SUSE, Amazon, Meta, uh, Flatcar, uh, Arch Linux, and a couple of independent um, uh, uh, developers as well. And I'm sure I forget some, there's a list somewhere. <laughs> um, so we uh, we met there, we talk about uh, these topics for two days. And in the end, we are, I say, quite pleased with the result. Uh, we came away with uh, quite a number of action items. Um, we are going to establish a repository where we will gather documentation and specification that are common to all the projects and people working on these topics. And we're working on that right now. We hopefully will publish that very soon. It's just a GitHub organization with a couple of uh, repositories. Um, we have a lot of action items on systemd because many of these uh, features depend or, or use systemd tools um and so we have a number of rfes um yeah that is the generic short summary of what we did and why um now we can cover a couple of topics uh, in more details um i think more a lot of these um apply to flatcar and oh of course um we what we noticed very quickly is that there is some overlap with many of these projects. There's not a perfect overlap between all of these uh, parties, um, but there are a lot of similar concepts. Uh, for example, there's two diverging ways of doing things. Like there's the image-based where Flatcal and the micro project um, do that we supply immutable images to uh, systems. And there is a slightly different way to do things with uh, RPM OS3 or with uh, butterfly sub volumes. 
just to give you an idea of where the difference are, but the core concepts are the same. We want to have systems that are immutable, that have enhanced security by default, that we use the TPM and the Inverity and so on and so forth. So just to cover a few of these concepts, we introduced, the, uh, there will be a lot of acronyms now, so <laughs> brace yourself. So we, are talk we talked about UKIs, Unified Kernel Images. So what these are, are um, secure boot signs, single files that wrap a kernel image, an initrd, and a kernel command line, and optioning a few other things. Um, why do we want this? Because you can have a single file that you ship and you put in your EFI partition and then you can boot uh, with secure boot for verification or that can be easily measured into the TPM because it's one thing and, and it's read only so it gives you the additional security. Um, we talked about DDIs. So what's a DDI? It's a discoverable disk image. Um, what is that and how it relates to UKIs? So a DDI is a self-described image. Uh, by image here, I mean just a raw GPT um, file. GPT is uh, the partition table. So following the DPS, which is Discoverable Partition Specification. I hope someone taking notes here. <laughs> uh, the Discoverable Partition Specification basically allows you to um, self-describe a partition on a GPT disk uh, with well-known GPT labels. You can say, okay, this partition is a root file system. This one is a slash USR file system. This one is var. This one is home. This one is DM Verity. Because of course, all of these are uh, support DM Verity as a first class concept. So that uh, if, for those who are not familiar, DM Verity allows you to have offline and online um, integrity checks enforced by the kernel. So every read of your um, block device uh, is enforced uh, in integrity by the kernel itself. And it can all chain up to uh, a signature. That, that can be validated by the kernel. Um, so with DDIs, and so with uh, UKIs, you put a kernel image with any RDs, and then you transition into your DDI, which can be a root file system or as a user file system. Um, these DDIs are a single concept that applies to many tools and systems. So not only to your uh, system as it boots, uh, as loaded by your UKI, your unified kernel image, but also, for example, um, to a portable service or an endspawn container, or they can be used to overlay additional files on top of your system. So we move to the next concept, which is the system extension. So this has been available in systemd since yeah, two years ago-ish. Um, again, the system extension is a particular type of DDI. So it is self-described, it's a GPT, it's very protected, signed, blah, 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 blah. Um, it allows you to extend a read-only uh, file system um, with additional binaries, files, and whatnot. Uh, again, same concept. This applies to many different components. It applies to your root file system, in which case it extends slash user or optionally slash opt for vendors, uh, third-party vendors. Uh, it applies to system services. So you, in your um, system, the unit, you can have extension images and point to a DDI. It will automatically overlay just for that service um, the additional files in slash user or slash opt. Um, this applies to endspawn containers, um, to again, as your root for system, uh, as I just said, and so on. Again, we have the same idea across all these components. We take one item and we make it work across your root file system, your initrd, your portable service, your system service, your endspawn container. So exactly the same format, same image, same concept applies to um, throughout the whole system. And given I touched on initrds, one of the big topics was how can we fix the glaring security holes that we have right now with um, interdis? Um, if you are not aware, right now you can, on, on Linux, on a standard Linux distribution, you boot Debian, you boot Ubuntu, you boot um, Fedora. It's secure boot protected. So your kernel is signed, your 
kernel modules are signed. Um, your disk, if your root fest can be encrypted uh, and sealed against the TPM. Um, your firmware is signed, but your initRD is still built locally every time on each individual machine. It's unsigned, it is unprotected, it's writable. So an attacker that gains write access to your disk uh, can just inject their binaries in your initRD and there is absolutely nothing you can do about it. After you transition into the full OS, the attacker, the attacker has control over it. So how can we fix this? Um, the idea is to use the DDI, UKI, and CZX concept so that um, the initRD too is read-only and signed and shipped by the vendor. So the vendor builds it on their server to share secure and lockdown and ships it to the users. Of course, the reason why we have inter this bit locally is that um, they need to change depending on the hardware. So we are using, proposing to use extensions so that the basic inter D is fixed um, and the same for everybody, but then you have various extensions that add uh, NFS drivers or BTRFS drivers or network, other network thing or whatever it needs. So we will build a dozen of extensions and they will be used on demand only when needed. Um, this is going to be, if everything goes to plan, going to be proposed for Fedora 39. Um, another concept that we talked about is the system configuration. So if your system is read-only, how can you update securely your configuration? Because you want to change a parameter of a random daemon, for example. Um, well, the idea that we want to introduce is, again, following the same pattern as before, the SysCFG. At some point, I will learn how to spell that out. Uh, so that stands for system configuration. Again, that is a DDI, and it overlays on top of slash etc instead of slash user. Uh, but same concept, the inverity protected can be measured as one thing. You can have multiple of them. Uh, it applies to your initRD, rootfs, services, etc. Um, another topic that we spent a lot of time on was uh, TPM-based security. Um, and so right now, what everybody does is measure into it. So if, to try and give you a bit of an idea. A TPM is a secure chip on the system um, that has an event log where you can append only certain uh, information, information called measurements. Basically, you append hashes to it. After you append a hash to it, you cannot go back. So this is used as a way to seal, oh, and uh, of course it has secret keys in it. So you can seal secrets against particular measurements. Uh, and the idea is you measure your firmware, your kernel, your components, and then if everything matches, you unlock the secret, say for your uh, disk image. Now, the problem is that if you measure hashes, for example, of your rootfs, and you update your rootfs, root the hash doesn't match anymore. Um, so that requires re-enrolling everything. Every time you change even one component, bootloader, kernel, um, kernel modules, uh, initRDs, rootfs, that is kind of a problem. So Leonard came up with an idea to instead uh, measure against signature of PCR hashes. Leonard, do you want to speak briefly about this um, to put you in? Because I've been blubbering for a long time. Uh, sure. Um... So uh, we don't measure signatures. We uh, still measure uh, the data and generate the hash values from it. But then we actually, instead of uh, binding our secrets to uh, uh, specific uh, hash values, we bind our secrets to uh, signatures of uh, hash values. Um, and by doing so, as long as... Uh, so basically, when you uh, enroll your disk encryption scheme, um, uh, uh, when you install the OS or when it first boots up, you basically provide uh, uh, a public key that says um, whenever, for example, a kernel is booted um, for which a PCR signature can be provided that matches the PCR values currently in place, um, then uh, release the secret for disk encryption to the OS. Um, and uh, so this, for the first time, gives us a way how we can in a non-brittle, like in a robust way, um, lock disk encryption even like in, in non-interactive setups, right? Like where the, 
where the system shall be able to boot up unattended. Um, so uh, yeah, that we basically release a secret only when uh, the software is uh, truly in order and we don't have to re-enroll every time uh, we do an update. Um, this actually, I, today I wrote a long uh, text about this, uh, which we, uh, like on request of uh, Microsoft Management, um, so that we can uh, uh, inform other parts of the company about this, in particular Marina and uh, Flatcar, I guess. Though the Flatcar people should probably mostly know this already. Um, uh, that, that explains all these details. There's a lot of uh, stuff to take in because it deals with UKIs and TPMs and PCRs and signatures and things like that. Loads of acronyms. <laughs> Lots and lots of acronyms. Um, so I tried hard in that document, which I guess I could share here. It's currently on Google Docs, though, because I wanted cooperation with some people outside of Microsoft. Um, but uh, yeah. Did they forget anything about DDI, CCFG, CZX, and all of that? Was that a mm. good enough summary? I think it was good enough summary. I mean, the, the key really is that we can compose this entire system at runtime from all these DDIs for different purposes. And I think this is a great um, opener for future stuff. Like, for example, you could express things that, where you say, I want this configuration extension to only apply to a local system in this time frame when the software is in order and, and, and things like that. Um, and thus you can use it for deploying secrets that need to be rolled over and things like that, where you can cryptographically make sure that if the systems don't catch up, they they uh, uh, lose access to your um, cluster and things like that. So uh, yeah, but that's, a, that's something we still need to write up, I guess. <laughs> yeah, so uh, there was a lot of interest in many of these components. For example, there was a lot of interest in the system CCFG. So I think we will see a lot of vendors try and come on board with that. Um, other things we <laughs> talked about, I, how, how long do we have? Uh, I'm I keep blubbering. Uh, I, well, you gave a great intro. Uh, I, I don't think we have time to dive into details, okay. but uh, we should we should definitely go yeah. over the big chunks. Yeah, and so of course, just... I mean, if, if there's any updates, right? Um, this is just a developing thing. We just kicked this off. Uh, if there's any updates, we will absolutely make sure to cover them here or like any better place that we find. So this is this is not a one-time thing if, if you don't want it to be. Yeah, absolutely. So just to conclude then, the key takeaway take away is that we are forming a GitHub org. We will start from a specification for the DDIs, CCFGs and the location they are at and to look for um, uh, UKIs and the partition uh, names and a couple of other things. For example, boot assessment, um, a standard way to say, yes, my boot was good um, or no, my boot was bad, roll back. Um, so we we'll start from these with this group of people and then we hopefully make it public in the next few weeks once we have put the piece in place and then take it from there allow you know input from everybody else we want input from the not just from these people of course it was just the start but from the whole community and um, yeah that's it for me just just to mention this i just dropped the the link to this document i wrote about the brave new trusted boot world into this uh, uh, Chat, it's not really supposed to be public. Please don't um, send this uh, out on some public website. But uh, if you're interested in further details, please read up and comment on it. That would be welcome, very welcome. I will eventually turn this into a blog story. Okay. Thank you for having us. Okay, so uh, 